Marie, thank you very, very much. And many thanks to Mark, to Marie, to Daniel, to Jessica, everybody else um, at our Basel. Um, as you know, this is a very sort of uh, long durational panel. It's been ongoing for more than 10 years, um, initially focusing on the museum, but in the last couple of years, mainly about artists and different aspects of artistic practice. Um, we're very, very excited today to discuss the topic of um, art and archaeology, and uh, please join me in welcoming very warmly Rosella Biscotti, Mariana Castillo de Bal, Simon Fatal, Susan Hiller, Jumana Mana, and Peter Wechtler. <laughs> We're going to have uh, short presentations or conversations with uh, the individual artists first, and we then explore some more uh, of these topics related to archaeology in conversations. The beginning really um, was the art historian Erwin Panofsky, who once said, we often invent the future out of fragments uh, from the past. But obviously, the uh, urgency of doing the panel here today has to do with the fact that so many artists in um, recently, and of course, also less recently, have worked in, on this topic. Uh, Eric Hobsbawm once told me that he believes that memory uh, is a very urgent topic and that we should somehow connect memory and archaeology. He felt that memory is a particularly urgent topic um, in the 21st century, where we think that maybe with the uh, internet and the exponential kind of explosion of information, we have more and more memory, but maybe it's actually very much amnesia, which is at the core of this uh, digital age. And this protest against forgetting, as Eric Hobsbawm called it, I think is very much led today in the 21st century by artists. So I don't think it's a coincidence that, that for that very reason, you know, notions of excavating, of digging are important. There have been lots of shows. Dieter Rullstadt did a show called Ways of the Shovel, and he talked about even a historiographic turn. Um, more recently, there is a show, Susan is going to tell us more about that, in um, uh, actually Mexico, of the Koppel Collection, which uh, explores notions of ruins and excavation um, as well. And uh, we're going to explore different questions in the conversation, such as there is a tension, of course, within archaeology and by extension within the practice of the artist as an archaeologist between an intense focus on objects and objecthood, and yet at the same time the immateriality of the content and history that charges these objects with interest. So to explore how do theories of provenance, relics, and material culture play into um, the practice will be one of the questions. We're also interested in this idea, of course, of the copy, uh, repetition, and difference, which is kind of interesting in relation to uh, the topic of archaeology. Also implicit within the action of archaeology is a desire to unearth gap information, uncovering hidden meanings, and sort of to what extent is this excavation um, a political act within the practice is maybe another aspect. And then last but not least, I'd like to mention here Jimmy Durham, uh, who has been a great inspiration uh, for me, you know, in the preparations of this panel, as, as he always is. Um, and he very early on uh, told me that actually uh, people are what really matters in uh, archaeology and that we should think about relations um, of people. And that's something which very much ties in with what Susan Hiller said in our Extinction Marathon and at the Serpentine we had with Gustav Metzger the Extinction Marathon, where Susan presented her uh, work on um, actually actually the extinction of languages, saying, you know, we focus a lot on, on the preservation of these languages, on archiving them, but not really on the people who, who actually die. So that will be another kind of important aspect for the later conversation. But let's now start with um, actually the first um, presentation, uh, conversation, and please give again a very, very warm welcome to Rosella Biscotti. And Rosella, you said you'd give us a short introduction in your link Is to okay. archaeology. And it's particularly fascinating because you've actually been working with archaeology very concretely on an archaeological yeah. site digging recently. <laughs> yes, uh, I have a little, I mean, uh, I would like to introduce first one theme related to my work. I have been thinking of, uh, like in the past years, there was uh, mainly, um, I, I was, my practice was mainly defined by being a detective of investigation. So the idea of investigation uh, and investigative research, and then lately moved to the idea of uh, being uh, artist and archaeology. So I have been thinking like, where does this shift? And, uh, and now with your introduction, was, I was thinking about the idea of materiality. So how do you ma materialize what is invisible? How do you kind of create traces of what is invisible? Uh, and uh, within this uh, 
broader idea of archaeology, I, I'm very connected to people, generally, to architecture, so to sites, and uh, with the idea of tracing, uh, casting, uh, uh, what is uh, uh, invisible, all, all the traces mainly of people, but also like on the idea of accumulating, so creating archaeology. And, um, and that has been many times in, in my work, uh, even like uh, thinking about people like actual bodies as archaeology, the mind of people as a, a place that we can excavate. Uh, I did a work on dreams uh, in a prison, and uh, for me that's a kind of archaeological work somehow. Uh, and lately, uh, I, for my first time, I got in contact with the site, archaeological site, and a beautiful Neolithic site in Turkey called Çataluk. Uh, and, uh, and I found it very interesting, and I decided two years ago to start uh, working there. Um, of course, the site in itself uh, has uh, incredible characteristics. It's uh, one of the first cities. So again, the theme of architecture is very important. And it's mainly made of common houses, uh, made of mud. Uh, so it should be kind of temporary, uh, if you want. So there are not stone monuments. There are, of, of course, a lot of artifacts, figurines, but uh, no temples. Uh, at, I mean, that's the contemporary theory of the site. Uh, so no shrines. Uh, and, uh, and all the figurines, all the artifacts were used in a uh, in a kind of uh, daily religion uh, that was inhabited by the, the daily life of these people. My interest uh, in this is again about uh, relationship. So we were talking about relationship of people because by being one of the first city, it's uh, very interesting and it's also defined as a proto-democratic society in which there are no differences of hierarchies, no difference in between genders and uh, of course, that's all theory, so it's, it's also our imagination, what we want to project on this place. And what I'm interested in is that the team that is excavating uh, is led by Yin Oder, which is a founder of post-processual archaeology. So he basically excavates this site with the same type of uh, methodology, which is processual. Uh, everybody has a shared data, and uh, everybody has a uh, possibility of interpretation. And uh, so I'm very interested in this double relationship, what we excavate, what we produce as a data, and also like how these two society of archaeologists and the Neolithic society can uh, like interact and imagine each other. And so that's uh, my main uh, like focus at this moment. And can you maybe tell us a little bit more about uh, also some previous works where you sort of focused on archaeology? I think, for example, excavation, if your manifesto project, the tasks of the community, where you basically actually acquired lead and industrial copper cables and, and kind of revisited that. Can you tell us how, how that worked? Uh, yes, it's, uh, it's a project. Uh, it's called uh, Title One: The Tasks of the Community. It's a project that is uh, uh, done uh, specifically uh, for uh, Manifesta 9 that was in a, in a former mine. So it has a very uh, developed history of industrialization. And then, then of course, was, uh, the, the mine was closed, I believe, in the 80s. And, uh, and then this site was the main building of the Manifesta exhibition. Uh, I connected with uh, something I was researching year before that was uh, in Lithuania a nuclear power plant uh, called Ignalina that uh, actually had to be closed because of the regulation with the, uh, the entry of Lithuania in the European Union. So I find that's very interesting and is a very archaeological somehow uh, nuclear power It was the same reactor of Chernobyl. So, of course, that's in the imagination of people was very heavy to accept within Europe. And uh, so I, uh, during the, the commission uh, time, I went there and I, uh, I was in two auctions, two public auctions. I applied for being there. And I acquired lead, uh, which, of course, is uh, this wonderful material which stops radiation, and uh, copper, uh, copper cables from the nuclear power plant. And then I recycled them, the lead into sculpture that were in the Manifesta uh, building. And the copper cable I made, uh, I recycled uh, in, a, in a factory that makes, again, cable. So it, it became a new power cable that powered the electricity of the Manifesta building. So basically, the lights, it was invisible to public, but the lights of the Manifesta building was coming from the former nuclear power plant of Lithuania. And a few yeah. years ago, I spoke about archaeology with, with Pierre Wieg, and he basically mentioned the sort of the word 
re, no, R E in terms of, of course, the idea also of you know um, the copy, uh, which we're going to discuss later, but also re in terms of recycling in relation to to archaeology, and that plays a role in the piece. I forgot now the title you did in 2013 in Venice, where you kind of uh, revisited archaeology, recycled compost was involved. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yes, more than recycling, I would say that that was uh, a kind of accumulation. So it was a way of creating a sort of archaeology. And it was, I worked in a um, uh, prison in Venice, uh, in the female prison of Judeca, for seven months. And I was conducting, uh, or mainly sharing dreams, with, uh, with a group of inmates. We were 14. Uh, and, uh, and from this dream, then we created an audio piece that was also playing, but only once in the... Venice Biennial, uh, and then uh, to represent the time, we were not allowed to make photographs, so to represent the time we were sharing together, I decided to reorganize the garbage of the prison, and uh, I have a sort of uh, um, accumulation of organic material, which was waste uh, from kitchen, and then from each uh, cell, they would uh, throw away all the vegetable and things that were uh, uh, like after eating, and uh, that was put to compost. So with the compost, then I realized the sculpture that was in the Venice Biennial. What is interesting is that this compost somehow it was a sort of messaging, because everybody knew that it would go to the Venice Biennial and it would go outside, so it became, and everybody has this, had a bin in the cell. So what you will put inside, it will become a sort of discussion, because it will be sent out somehow as a sort of messaging or even kind of rituality. So this compost was made of all of that, and the sort of architecture that created is, uh, it resembled the architecture of dreams. So it was a little bit undefined. Uh, it resembled a sort of uh, like walls, but it was also like uh, totally open to certain interpretation. Maybe a last question we discussed over breakfast earlier today, the kind of connection to the digital, because obviously this is of a whole new field. Uh, I mean, not completely new. It's been going on since the 80s, kind of called media um, archaeology. So kind of connecting archaeology to, to media, connecting archaeology to the digital. And you were talking about your research in Turkey and how there is almost too much data now and how actually that sort of whole digital uh, archaeology changes the way archaeology works. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, yes, I found it very interesting because uh, in, uh, in a site, for example, like Çataluk uh, in Turkey, uh, where there are many, many um, uh, specialists on site, so there will be this year uh, around uh, 200, uh, and uh, with this, uh, also this methodology of uh, data sharing, everybody has his own interpretation, everybody makes his own photograph. Of course, there is not uh, an immediate uh, type of uh, official interpretation, and then there is an overproduction of data. So I find it very interesting because in the moment in which we share all this data, so everything is available, but still uh, there is a a necessity or navigate through it. And there is an overproduction of this data. So how do you narrate this site? And I think it's, again, a, a question about editing and a question about narration that I think is very important. So even if it's a multi-voices, so it's a, a multi-narration, how do you navigate through it and construct something? Great, Rosella, many, many thanks. And this idea of you doing this very concrete kind of uh, longer periods of research and fieldwork uh, leads us right away to our next speaker, to Mariana Castillo di Bal. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Mariana. <laughs> Mariana, you uh, told me as well this morning about your kind of very concrete fieldwork. Can you maybe tell us, sort of as an introduction, your connection to archaeology? Yeah, well, I was trying to remember now when was the first time I thought about archaeology. And uh, I think it, it has to do with a dream, curiously enough. So my mother was like refurbishing the garden in the house. And there was a worker who was helping her to do the construction. And he came in the morning and he said, you know what, we need to stop fixing this. Because I had a dream that there is something really valuable in this garden. So then they started digging. And then it took like two months digging, and they never found anything. But it was like a sort of <laughs> curiosity. I mean, it, it was a dream. So at the end, archaeology has to do with this imagination, with this fantasy that we can actually connect to our past, which is not true, but we do our best. And um, so the first time I, I started integrating archaeology in, into my work was the when I was 
doing an exhibition in Mexico called These Ruins You See, and it was about what I was calling at the time the margins of archaeology. So it's not actually the practice of archaeology, but everything that it's around. So the museums, the archaeological sites, the people, how it is connected to education, especially in Mexico. How you have the feeling that there is always something underneath, even if you cannot see it. And um, based on this, I also started to work with many anthropologists and archaeologists who are busy as well with uh, forgeries, with copies, with how you actually study the archaeological material, how you distribute it within different communities. So you have official communities, you have unofficial communities, you have looting of archaeological sites, you have, um, you have books, you have essays, you have academics. And from this project, uh, suddenly there was a kind of repertoire of, of themes and ways of working that, that I've been following step by step. And so that's more or less how I can describe the, my first archaeological impulse, as you can call it. And some time ago, when uh, around 2000, I did an exhibition in the Sir John Sons uh, Museum in, in London, the amazing house of the late uh, Sir John Son, the architect. Uh, we organized um, a lecture in the in the kitchen because the kind of zones uh, kitchen is still you know in existence and Cedric Price gave a very memorable uh, lecture about uh, cities dying you know Angkor Wat and the idea that we always think cities last forever and he talked about archaeology and cities and the death uh, of cities and it was amazing because basically. Um, the lecture became more and more about food and architecture and led to a dinner. And at that dinner was the only time ever I met Eduardo Paolozzi. And the late Eduardo Paolozzi talked a lot that night about archaeology. And I'm very interested in your kind of revisiting Paolozzi and uh, your connection of Paolozzi to the 19th century explorer and archaeologist Alfred Maudsley and the way you actually use these paper casts, which obviously uh, do avoid that uh, anything gets destroyed on the site. So I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about that story, Paolozzi, Maudsley, um, and this idea of, of, uh, of paper, paper casts. Well, I was also, as I said, very interested in the ways you, you kind of approach the archaeological material or the archaeological site. So the most obvious approach nowadays would be digital photography, but in the past there were casts and molds and drawings and conversations and texts. And there was a technique developed in the 19th century which was uh, these paper casts that were called paper squeezes. So they were actually imprints of the different objects. And they were also very light, so they could transport them something to Europe very easily and make uh, pieces out of it. So I also started working with this material and I discovered that Eduardo Paolozzi was also obsessed with this idea of the transgression of the original. So how can you copy it? And in this, in this wish to understand it, you're also transforming it into something else. So it becomes already the negative and it becomes already like a mirror of the, of the original. And for instance, now in the British Museum, they have all these molds that they were considered as not so important. But if you go now to the original archaeological sites, many of them are destroyed. So actually, this, these objects, these plaster objects, have now more information than the original, which I find quite interesting. And you also mentioned once that uh, an, an exhibition Paolozzi curated uh, inspired you. Can you tell us about that, about that show? Which yeah, she made the a beautiful show in the Museum of Mankind, which yeah. doesn't exist anymore, which was called uh, Lost Magic Kingdoms. I think it's also a beautiful title. And six paper moons. And the paper moons were related to a Mexican goddess. And he was also working a lot with papier mache, and he chose different objects from the ethnographic collection that were never shown before, especially related to toys and to garbage and to daily use. And he combined this with his own sculptures, with his own collages, because at the end he had this, I mean, if we talk about the digital, he didn't have a digital mind. It was more of a college mind. It's more a modern mind somehow. 
And maybe a last question. In your exhibition in the Hamburger Bahnhof, uh, Paragon, you talked about biographies of, of things. And it kind of resonated with something the, uh, the German designer Konstantin Gritschic once uh, told me when we worked on an exhibition where he said, you know, we always look, look at objects, but we don't really have the whole trail, the whole trail, the whole history, you know, basically of the, the what you call the itinerant lives, the, the wanderings of these objects. And it's something you explored in this exhibition um, uh, of these sort of almost archaeological objects by actually having their biographies. Can you tell us about that? What's the biographies of things? Yeah, I think it has also to do with what Rosella was saying about the, the relationship. So an object actually doesn't exist if there is not a relationship that activates it. And in that sense, what it's really amazing about archaeology is that you have an object that can actually have so many lives, so many ways of, of existing, of becoming present. And in this exhibition, I was, I was studying how these objects become present in different moments, how they crystallize themselves. Great, and that is a very direct uh, transition to um, San uh, Fatal, who also works in, in a very, very much with a concrete uh, fieldwork. And Simon, we were in uh, your studio actually last week and uh, two weeks ago, and it was just a moment when the whole uh, uh, tragic events around Palmyra were unfolding, and you um, obviously spent a lot of time in Palmyra researching, as you did on many other archaeological sites, and it's one of your many parallel realities as a publisher, as a sculptor, as an artist, and also as an archaeologist. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Simon Fatal. Uh, <coughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you, Hans Ulrich, for inviting me. Um, yeah, I would like to uh, relate how I started working um, with this ancient past that is also our present because uh, we come from countries where the, the past is always there. And the work of art has no time. Um, as Malraux said that once, that the work of art <coughs> has its own time. It's always present. Anyway, I was a painter and then living in Beirut and the civil war started, I went to America. <clears throat> and there I just stopped painting because what I was interested in was my landscape in Beirut that was gone. I started my publishing house and then a few years later I went to, to school to start doing sculpture. It was a given that I was going to do uh, clay, but actually on the first day, the professor shows you many elements to choose from. And I chose a piece of marble that was quite big. And it just talked to me. Uh, it, was a, it looked like something I knew. So I did something of it. And I called it a torso found in Peru today. So this just, uh, the it's the same thing as you would find in an archaeological site. <clears throat> and so this compression, this juxtaposition of the past and the contemporary started to inform all the work that came after that. Actually, the second work also was not clay. It was uh, made in wax for bronze. And it was Adam and Eve. So I could say I started from the beginning. And uh, then uh, I started producing men and women. I started, therefore, with clay. And I'm still doing clay. Now, why clay? It's the primordial element. It contains all the others. Man was made of clay, but not only man. Nature came, as in Islamic mysticism, from the clay that was left over by God after creating man. So clay contains all the other elements. It's alive. And um, it, it's also the most direct thing you could do. I know modern art likes mediated. My work is direct. I, 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 
I touch the clay and um, I produce these uh, objects. Men, women, ziggurat, a woman, tours. Actually, I could show you pictures if I. I think. Oh. I'm not sure. Oh, look, we're here. Oh, yeah. That's uh, a woman. Then here, if you push here. Or here. Yeah, this is the right direction. So these, I call them warriors. Um, they are being, you know, one meter high. And also the clay is, all, although direct, it can also, it, uh, it follows that. Uh, so the warriors, the idea of the warriors came f like the same first piece, which was related to the war being waged in Lebanon. Now it's waged all over the Middle East, so. Uh, this is actually a stele. The form was in a, uh, uh, in a Syrian piece, which I liked very much, and I wrote on it a quote from Ibn Arabi in Arabic. These are centaurs. It's a recurring theme in my work. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is also where you see the past and the present in one piece. It's an uh, Iraqi soldier coming back from war, and he is uh, welcomed by his wife and his dog. So you can see the, the link with Ulysses. Um, of course, it's not the same house. <laughs> this is an archaeology, I, I called it prehistoric goddess. This is a cavalier with him. In one piece, you see the, the, the horseman and the horse. It's really exactly what you see in our archaeological site. But what I say, uh, yeah. this is man, woman, and young girl. This is a cavalier with him. In one piece, you see the, the, the horseman and the horse. This is Gilgamesh. It's very amazing that you could see Gilgamesh in that sense, but actually, three legs trying to run. Guy holding two lions under his arms, but also like this. And what I, this is an angel. I don't know how to, ah. This is a man trying to flee the war. So he has three legs trying to run. This is also. And this is Balkis. You know, Balkis, uh, when she meets Salomon, she lifts her, her, her dress. And you could see her legs. This is doors. This is a, more about Syria today. I called it doors. This is also doors, meaning the passage is quite difficult. And this is a collage about Syria. You see the map, and in 1921, the, all the, the north of the map has it's a whole piece of land given to Turkey. Then another one, I mean, all the different uh, decoupage which are being done today again. We have started in 1921, and I have put archaeological artifacts from the Baghdad Museum and Aleppo Museum, and some of mine, which go very well together. And I think, why do they go together? Because I think these gods and goddesses were made with the same intent that I, I have, um, the same philosophy which sustains it. And I think this is how I can call myself an archaeologist. That's another collage about Syria today. That's the collage I was mentioning, which I saw the other day. 
um, when we visited the studio. And basically, um, uh, it's actually when we looked at this that you told me that you spend a lot of time during your childhood, basically, in, in Sy Syria, in, yeah. in Palmyra. Can you tell us about these, these memories? Well, uh, this is all the colonnades of Palmyra on the right-hand side. The goddess over there is from Palmyra Museum, and then the stele. And you have Adam and Eve in the middle of the map, which, is, which are mine. Uh, Palmyra, well, it was a very important place for me. I used, we used to go. Text, Etel Adnan wrote an amazing text on, 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 on your work. And time in the Zenobia Hotel. And uh, what can I say? It's one of the most beautiful places <laughs> on earth. <laughs> Let's see. Thank you very much, Simon. Maybe one thing which would be great to hear is uh, from you more. I, I read this text. Etel Adnan wrote an amazing text on, 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 on your work. And, talk there also about Nietzsche. One can remember what Nietzsche has already said, that the one who belongs completely to his time, the real contemporary, is the one who does not coincide perfectly with it, but defines himself or herself as unnatural. Uh, it's obviously something also Giorgio Agamben uh, wrote about. And you talked a lot about the way how you use these um, archaeological findings from Mesopotamia, from Syria, from ancient ages, but that are at the same time also today. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, uh, well, to me, uh, these, these, uh, go, I mean, these archaeological sites, these uh, gods and goddesses are very uh, alive. I think of them all the time. I mean, they're more alive in me than most things I, I look at. <laughs> um, I think your history inf inhabits your mind all the time. So when it, you, you talk about your present, you talk about all these layers at the same time. I think it's, it's one thing. And can you tell us about the, the research now with, with archaeology? Are you working on new, uh, new sites? Uh, I think I'm going to be working more and more about Syria, Yeah, which is... Uh, our daily preoccupation. Uh, yeah, our history is being erased. And I think the war that is waged on uh, art, uh, cultural artifacts is as important and as big and as tragic than waged on people, because people can be replaced. These things cannot be replaced. And the ideas. Uh, are, of, that they represent are so important. If we are deprived of them, we can be zombies. We don't exist anymore. We don't have, we're not human beings. And it's a history that concerns the whole planet. It's not only us. Simon, thank you very, very much. And that idea, That idea of, of erased uh, history, uh, and, and uh, again, Eric Hofstrom protest against forgetting leads us right away to Susan Hiller, to our, our next speaker. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Susan Hiller. And Susan, maybe to begin with the beginning, uh, you talked before about this idea that actually um, uh, there are different kind of ways to, to kind of deal with this topic of archaeology. One is to kind of see more as, as history and how one connects to history, but the other is real field work, is the, is the digging. And you obviously have a history with archaeology as a, as a real practice, and you've just written a text for this exhibition of Coppel in, in Mexico, and maybe that would be a good point of departure. You tell us a little bit about what you wrote there, about the artist as an archaeologist. Oh, okay. Um, it's really, I've been very interested in what, what everyone has said, and I, I'm particularly interested, I just want to say one thing about it. I'm interested in the fact that it seems clear to, to everyone on this panel that if we're talking about archaeology, there are, there are several elements. One is the artifacts. One is the, uh, the data, if you like, that can be gleaned from that. And then the next thing is our projection onto that of what these things mean. I mean, we, for example, have a fantasy that long ago people were very religious and blah, blah. Maybe they weren't religious at all. We have no way of knowing. You know, if you don't find a shrine, you have no religious artifacts. So I love all that. I mean, the whole thing together <laughs> becomes a very special way of looking at things. And 
I did do anthropology and within that archaeology, Mesoamerican archaeology, and I was involved in the so-called scientific study of artifacts and so forth. Um, and I also studied art, so my practice became a kind of merger of those things. And in this essay, I tried to discuss that historically, but you know, you should never believe what artists say about their work. We know that. It's so incredibly difficult to talk about your work um, from the inside and the outside simultaneously. So I'm just going to tell you about a very early work of mine, okay, which was explicitly archaeological. And from this, I have developed, I think, a methodology with which I examine cultural artifacts from our own society, contemporary society, not the past. Um, so I am interested in the biography of artifacts, for example, postcards, superstitions, paintings, all sorts of things. The methodology I developed started with actual archaeological fragments that I found on a rubbish dump um, in New Mexico many, many years ago. And you know that in many cultures that produce fired ceramics, when the pottery breaks, they throw the ceramics out onto a rubbish dump, which also includes vegetable matter, feces, all sorts of things. Eventually, over time, the uh, organic materials kind of rot down and you're left with the pottery. So the pottery in this case had been <clears throat> the midden that where the pottery was, or the garbage dump, had been bulldozed to make a highway. And uh, this happens a lot in Latin America. It also happens in the southwest of the United States because there was such a dense original population there and they produced so many artifacts. These artifacts were just scattered along the road. And I was driving past and I saw them and I was absolutely, I jumped out of the car, I began picking them up. They were just beautiful. Bits of painted pottery with designs and I just fell in love with them aesthetically. And I put them in a box and uh, kept them for many years. And after I had disengaged from anthropology and had, in fact, been involved in a whole critique of anthropological and archaeological practice, I still had these things and I still wanted to do something with them. So what I did was a very impure kind of investigation, not the kind of thing an anthropologist or an archaeologist would do, because I was interested in the fact that I found that all these ceramics were made by women. And, okay, now here I'm gonna go into my feminist thing. Um, at that time, many, many years ago, when in cultures that were not European, the ceramics were made by men, such as in Asia, they were thought to be fine art. But when they were made by women, they were called craft. And this really annoyed me. So, <clears throat> I began looking into that, and then I found out something really interesting. Another thing that was always said by archaeologists about the beautiful painted motifs on the southwestern United States pottery was that they were um, kind of repeated, repeated from year after year after year that there was no creativity, no originality, blah, 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 blah. Of course, that was because they were made by women and women didn't have creativity or religion or anything. So I decided to look into that and I found some contemporary ethnography about um, women of that area, of descendants from the people who'd made this other pottery. And they were still making pottery and it was exquisite. And the way they talked about it fascinated me because they talked about it the way contemporary artists talk about their work. When you said to them, or when I said to them, where did you get this great idea you know, for the ceramics? They either said, oh, I got it in a dream, in other words, through inspiration, or they said, we go out to the rubbish dumps and we pick up this old pottery and from this tiny little bit, we create a whole new design. Well, this is what we do, you know. So from that point on, I became convinced that artists are always doing archaeology. I can't, I can't say this very clearly. Whether or not you're using an explicitly archaeological uh, procedure or, or, or investigating things in that kind, using that kind of methodology, the fact that we inevitably take fragments from the past and rework them 
to represent them, to add our own to things to them, is archaeological. And so that idea of archaeology has, has persisted to kind of um, help me, if you like, develop a practice. Um, that's all I want to say. And also, um, you mentioned earlier today, uh, when we had coffee, that uh, you quoted Freud, when you dig up something, yeah. it's dead. And obviously, one of the things which often comes up in relation to your work in archaeology is the uh, Freud Museum project and yeah. the whole way with archaeological boxes and, yeah. and memory you worked there. Can you tell us a little bit about um, that when you dig up something, it's dead, and how it all connects to Freud? Well, OK. Uh, you know, I think this has come out in things that people have said today. We don't. Say how can I put this? Professional archaeologists, on the whole, think that we can uh, retrieve a lot of meanings about the past from archaeology. And so our culture is extremely interested in digging into the past in that way. Um, and of course, when artifacts like Palmyra are destroyed, for us, in our way of thinking, this is, you know, this is terrible. But Freud seems to have had a slightly different idea. Um, he was, he talked about, first of all, he said that psychoanalysis was a form of archaeology. But he said that it was superior to archaeology because he claimed in psychoanalysis, when you dug up something from the past, you got the whole thing. You got all the meanings connected to it. Whereas we have no one to tell us uh, the contextualized meanings of the objects from the past. So he had friends who were archaeologists, and he himself collected archaeological artifacts. And he had them on his desk when he was psychoanalyzing people, and would pick one up and talk about it. And you know, he was very interested in archaeology. But he said that the ruins of Pompeii only died once they were dug up. And I think what he meant by that is some things that have come out today, that, of course, we are just putting our meanings on, onto Pompeii. You know, We do the best we can uh, to empathize with our dead ancestors, you know, but we really are not able to do that. And he, he felt that when Pompeii was buried, like uh, neurotic meanings are buried, that it, they had a, a certain energy that once they come out into the light of day, the archaeological things lose that magic and they become sort of inert in a sense. We, we don't have the right to imagine or fantasize on artifacts in a museum, you know, when we're presented with the text. This means this, this means this. I mean, you know, that's what I was talking about, I think. Now, another work which has a very direct connection to archaeology is your psychic archaeology, which is um, a, actually um, video, a video project was in, installed in a medieval world. Can you tell us about this psychic archaeology? Well, I said that I became interested in dealing with cultural artifacts from our own society, and among those things are ideas that are discredited or objects that are trivial, like postcards or things like dreams that most people aren't interested in. And um, I'm very interested in the way our society deals with the irrational, uh, the occult, the mysterious, et cetera, et cetera. So I was offered an opportunity to make a site-specific work in a very strange place in Bristol in England. There's a park, and in the middle of this park, I'd never seen this before. It came as a shock to me. It's a little building that looks like a public latrine, basically. And it had a sign on the front that said it was the only remains of the former castle of Bristol, um, because Bristol was bombed during the war, etc. And this is what was left, and it was this little building. But when you went inside the little building, it was actually a medieval vault, which was absolutely strange and wonderful. And then I looked into the, you know, the way artists work. I looked into the history of the site and discovered that um, the castle was where Edward III had imprisoned the Jews in order to extract money from them through torture to finance the Crusades, etc., etc., etc. And the whole thing just opened up like an archaeological project to me. And I began to look at this idea of the castle and its representations and started looking at films 
uh, about the Crusades and Richard III and et cetera and all of that. And do you know the, the novel by Sir Walter Scott Ivanhoe, which deals with this? I looked at the film Ivanhoe and various other films, and I realized that the presentations of uh, Jews in these films were extremely strange. And so I made a piece and situated it in this medieval vault. I took all these moments of uh, stereotypes, stereotypical presentations, and I put them together into one film. Somebody told me it was the most frightening thing he'd ever seen. I didn't intend it to be so, but I named the piece Psychic Archaeology because what it did, apparently, and what it does is to dig into these hidden uh, archetypes that we've all internalized. So we have, in my selections of films, Jews as criminals, Jews as magicians, people with special powers, you know, it goes back and forth in the way that fairy tales do. And I think we could do this with almost any uh, cultural stereotype, you know. Um, this was one that came to me to use because of the site and so forth. So psychic archaeology to me is Again, this is what artists are doing. You know, they are re-representing uh, given reality in different ways. That's all. Susan, thank you so, so much. Thank you, thank you very much. It's now my great, great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Jumana Mana, and actually the sort of idea of uh, erased history and the idea also that actually when we dig up something, it's that leads straight away to your practice and to many of the works you've been doing. I think, for example, of the exhibition at the uh, Sculpture Center where you talked about erased histories. Uh, so maybe we start with your statement. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe to pick up from Susan, first of all, uh, I think I think it's true that we're, we're always doing archaeology also as artists. Um, maybe it's a metaphor or a method or a process, but in a sense, we're always looking for a kind of rootedness or relationship to our past um, and, and, and creating uh, creating our place in these worlds. Um, if it's within our practice or the, the research of the places uh, we get into. Um, so I think it's a very important process of, uh, of artistic practice. And um, yeah, recently, last year, um, I, I was working directly on an archaeological site. Um, I don't know if we can get the image uh, up, yeah. Uh, so this is an image from my show, Menace of Origins, last year at Sculpture Center, uh, where I was interested in drawing connections between uh, an archaeological site in East Jerusalem um, in Arabic, it's Wadi al In Hebrew, uh, Ir David. Uh, it's it's a it's a um, it's a very contested site in Silwan, which is a Palestinian neighborhood just outside the old city walls, um, where uh, some of the earliest um, digs took place in Jerusalem in the mid 19th century by the British um, Palestine Exploration Fund, and uh, it is claimed that this is. Um, where the city of David used to be, David being the king from uh, the Old Testament. Uh, this is disputed if this is the case or not, but I was especially interested in this site because um, uh, it has been privatized into uh, by a settler, right-wing settler organization, which is openly using the archeology span and uh, these kind of dubious proofs to also expel the Palestinian residents from their homes. Um, I had also done a film four years before that called Blessed Blessed Oblivion about um, th so-called thug culture uh, in East Jerusalem or the performance of manlyhood um, and maybe the lower social um, parts of society and how, how the structure of uh, identity of, of manlyhood is being um, uh, built with, with cars and, um, and pump bodies and uh, maybe more superficial um, performances of power. So f for me, this show was connecting the, the superficial threat of these young men living in this neighborhood of Silwan and the, and the archaeological d uh, digs, which are structural violence uh, being committed by the uh, Israeli antiquities authorities and specifically Al Ad in this, uh, in this case. So I guess archaeology is, is, is always being used as, um, as a way of, for uh, educating and propagating certain national narratives and, and views of civilization, but uh, in the case of Jerusalem, I think it's especially politicized and problematized because there's an ongoing colonial situation, and so there's an ongoing erasure of our present as Palestinians. Um, yeah. Do you have more images? Or? Yeah, I have. <laughs> 
So this is just um, um, a porch uh, from Silwan. Uh, I was also looking at the connection between the kind of contemporary limestone of um, poorly built Palestinian homes or infrastructure of the neighborhood and the, the ancient limestone of the archaeology and that they're, they're both existing in the same or very close to one another and um, the kind of relationships that can be extracted from that. Uh, so the show in a sculpture center was also about taking certain elements out of the context of this neighborhood um, and, and also in a way reclaiming some of these archaeological artifacts which I was kind of in a state of wonder or awe towards but at the same time conflicted because I couldn't appreciate them simply for, um, for their beauty because they were always being framed by these certain touristic sites um, with very specific views of, of, of history which not everybody could enter as well. Uh, so for me, it was also about liberating these 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 forms or these this specific archaeological site of the King David um, from its narrative and reclaiming it in a way that I could appreciate it on my own terms. Um, and this is um, oh, that's cropped. Um, that's kind of the next iteration of this um, of this interest in Silwan or this, this juxtaposition of them. Um, the thug culture and the, and the archaeology. Um, so I did a new series of uh, vases which were in the shape of muscles or body fragments and it's called Walk Like a Vase. Oh. Oh, yeah. So um, that's another one uh, of the muscle vases or rooms. Maybe it's a a large empty muscle or a, or a container or a chamber of some sort. Thank you very, very much. So one thing we uh, she wanted to discuss more is about the way you connect to archives also, because in a way, um, a lot of sort of your connection to archaeology has to do with, with archives and uh, Reading, you know, through some of your your interviews, you talk about the incorporation of archival materials as a conversation, where you say that the kind of archaeological approach comes from realizing that the conditions we live in and work under are not those we created, but those created by our historical circumstances. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how you use archives for your films and also for the installations? Yeah. Um, so yeah, just about that. I think. I've thought of archaeology as the kind of material equivalent to the archival practice, uh, ar archaeology being kind of a method of material history and examining our relationship to, to the goods and the way um, we consume them and how they define who we are and how they affect us. Um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> Archives, I mean... <laughs> What, what, what kind of archives is it based on? Do you do you have an archive, or how, or do you do field work? <laughs> I think both. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've. Uh, I think. I think. Uh, I mean, again, in the case of Jerusalem, archives are, are specifically contested. But um, uh, I think. I think I've been interested in archive in a in the broader sense, not just in the kind of institutional archive, but uh, archive of the materials that are around us. Um, uh, also contemporary waste, uh, which is something I've worked also a lot with and, and juxtaposing that with more kind of valued uh, notions of archive. And we talked before uh, with Mariana also about, you know, the idea of, uh, um, of, of Paolozzi and the idea of what Cedric Price talked about, you know, archaeological finds of cities which disappeared. And there's also an interesting link in your work to that. There's a project actually, um, a sketch of manners, where you looked into a kind of a, a project from earlier in the 20th century called Imagine City, and it has to do with your interest in Alfred Roche, can you tell us a little bit about the, more about this research and how it connects to, to, to cities of archaeology? Yeah, yeah that's maybe uh, closer to the kind of archival impulse or kind of dealing with, with images and oral histories. But uh, Sketch of Manners um, is a film inspired by a black and white image I found of a group of Palestinians dressed as Pierrot's uh, from 1921. And uh, this was a, a masquerade party that was taking place at Alfred Rock's house. Alfred Rock was a politician, a Palestinian politician, uh, and a landowner. Um, and uh, I, was, I was quite fascinated with this image uh, because it, it, it defied my, my imagination or kind of the general imagery of, of what Palestine was before the Nakba, before the erasure of Palestine in 1948. 
and um, it, it kind of opened up um, a layer of, uh, of history of a specific uh, class in Palestine, kind of an upper urban class, uh, which was living this um, very international lifestyle and traveling and um, being quite close to the, to the colonial rule, if it's the British or the French. And, um, and, and, and it, it kind of resonated with the way uh, many of us live today who are from, let's say, the, 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 the cultural scene in Palestine who uh, are, are, are between very many cultures. And it was interesting to see that this was already existing nearly 100 years ago. Uh, so this, this film, um, I, I invited uh, friends and family to, to come to a masquerade party uh, in the American Colony Hotel, a small uh, hotel in uh, East Jerusalem and uh, to relive this moment. So, so the, film, the film was just about that. It was f filming, filming this party and then um, building a voiceover, a narrative over it afterwards that tried to kind of reimagine Alfred Rock vis-a-vis um, -vis my, my life and that of um, uh, the people around me in Jerusalem. And also recently, and that's maybe my last question, you started to work with Norman Klein and researching actually um, about the history of forgetting and uh, the erasure of memory once more there, the, the protest against forgetting. And you kind of connect Jerusalem and Los Angeles in a way that you bring these two cities together. They're kind of two promised lands, as you say, of opposite sorts. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um yeah, so uh, Norman and I talked a lot about uh, Jerusalem and Los Angeles. Uh, his father is buried in Jerusalem, and that kind of prompted a lot of discussions between us. And uh, in his book, History of Forgetting, talks about the, the, the erasure of Los Angeles. And, and I, I, when I read it, and also through speaking to him, I thought how interesting that both, both cities are being um, erased because there's a fantasy being projected on them and, and what these cities are and what they should be that's, con that's continuously erasing the present of what, what it actually is. So the kind of imagined fantasies of others, of if it's an industry or if it's a religious fantasy, is, is, is erasing the present lives. Romana, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, well, my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Peter Bechtler. And Peter, maybe we should start with a statement also from you. I mean, you recently had an exhibition, a great exhibition in New York, where there were lots of links to archaeology. I remember these plaster sculptures, but then there were watercolors of Roman kind of antiquity and also of a, a kind of an archaeological tomb of some sorts. And uh, yeah, let's, let's start with your statement. Uh, yes. Um, maybe I can talk a little bit how, how this whole research uh, developed and it was uh, 10 years ago or maybe even a little bit more after my studies and uh, I have a great respect of its scientists in general and maybe that's why I was very attracted to um, giving myself the scientific aura of archaeologists or as a scientist and uh, it actually also made my own job look like a true profession so I was I was occupied with something researching and also uh, because I was writing also at this time and um, I, I had to write a lot of application texts and in the early 2000s I think, well like mid to early 2000s, 2005 I think, uh, the only way to get federal money was to apply for research based projects. And I, I try to get into the slang of applications and try to give good reasons and, and sound more reasonable than I... And um, yes, so that's, that's why I, I started with this. And I went uh, to different occasions, also not really historical sites, but more like social things. They were linked to archaeology in a way. For example, one thing was a visit to a role player festival we were all like it's all people and costumes fantasy costumes and this took place on a, in a at a historical castle too and uh, there was also somebody imprisoned there it was thomas Münzer, and now it was turned in the gdr into a youth hostel and so on and um surrounded by these people and costumes i i thought about 
of, of applications, you know, like how how to use this. And actually, that this Thomas Münzer was uh, in prison. There was kind of a gold mine because this, there was material for at least four or three shows. I would say, like, and and he was he was a socialist in a way, a very early revolutionary. He was linked to the farmers' war in um, in in Turing, in Bad Frankenhausen. You know these these thing that was taken up by the GDR memorial system. So he was a very highly uh, associative figure and he even wrote for himself so I just could take over his speeches and um, make something. And I tried to, even when I was still there with these people, I tried to uh, research on this person and I, I tried to get some kind of culture grip on him or on on the whole thing but i i somehow couldn't i uh everything was kind of sinking away all this material was i was slipping and and kind of a swamp of history of all this i i didn't know about my my ambitions anymore about this And I was desperately looking for a link for this to this person. And then I read, okay, 1526, he was f tortured for five days. And then um, he was uh, beheaded and somehow nailed to the gate or something like this. And I thought, this, this might be a possible link because I also feel tortured. I feel tortured by my profession. I feel tortured by my perspectives, by my memories. I feel by my whole job and by the people I am supposed to film here for this, for this movie I would like to do. And also, uh, he's dead, so, and I also want to be dead. So the, it, is, was, it was really morphing into something else. It was not more relating to each other, it was more growing out of proportion. You know, things were uh, not, I couldn't, uh, keep up with my own pattern that I'd like to introduce. Like, you know, you could take a thing like this and um, generate works with it. And I, I, I couldn't do it. And um, I had problems. This is maybe a kind of tension that is still in the show uh, that I have problems with these patterns of working, problems of. of um, of restriction in, in intellectual systems and traditions and and I, I'm just trying to oppose not oppose but somehow I not even find a place I I just use it as a reference to uh, describe very current restrictions I would say can you tell us more about this, this movie? Because already when we met in Brussels a few months ago, you mentioned this I, uh, unrealized movie, and I'm dying to know more about that. No, it's, it's realized. It's, well, Is it now realized? Yeah, yeah, no, it was already then, but it's very long, and it's very dry. And, I, um, and it's just a description of my stay here, sometimes almost falling into this research, but then, then also getting out of it again, because it's like a kind of, as I said, a little bit of a swampy ground. And... Um, yeah, it's not very spectacular. It's more about the people building up uh, their their tents. Uh, they, you know, it's not really about them posing with their fake weapons. It's it's more. I, d I also don't know why I always come back to it. I, it also was maybe an initial point for thinking about uh, what I should not do. Uh, <laughs> and in a way. There is also another form of archaeology in your work, which is a kind of archaeology of the just past. And uh, I was very excited to see your, your work in, in Zurich in the exhibition curated by Freddy Fischli and Nils Olsen, which was at the, um, uh, actually at the Luma and the Westbau. And you, you basically there exhibited a um, kind of archaeology of recent architecture maquettes. Oh, yeah. You had sort of fished them out of the garbage bin, I think, of an architecture school. Can you tell yes, us about yes. that piece? It, it was in the, um, in, the, in the basement of this archaeologic, uh, architectural school, and, and they had a lot, these models, they were kind of touching for me because they had so many efforts and so many uh, uh, despair, and all, but also so, many, so much hybris in it. You know, they were thinking they were 
like 18, they are very young and brothers, maybe they were like 21 designing whole cities for themselves and their friends. So, you know, like it's a, I kind of like this overview or this, uh, this yeah, this hybrid. Yeah. And one thing I also wanted to know more is about, about your writing because you have sort of parallel realities, of course, you know, you mentioned the films, there's your exhibitions, but then there is also you as a writer. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, um, I think it, ca it was al always related to the films, and then it, it changed that I wrote the voiceover for my text uh, for my films, and then uh, it it also came from this descriptive, semi pseudo uh, un uh, well, analytical text about um, situations or social situations. And then it, did, it had a kind of private drift at some point where I was more uh, concerned with, with, with how finding different ways, more distancing myself from, from plain descriptions. But I'm, I'm also not so sure because I, I tend to say that I'm, I'm not a real writer, as everybody in the, in the arts in a way. But I'm, I don't know if that's... Um, uh, reasonable, because it, it you know it's just writing or it's not. And then if I'm either I'm a bad writer or I'm not a writer, you know it's not you cannot sneak around. But this is my sy system, <laughs> you know that I that I don't have to define myself. I, I th and that I felt very comfortable with this uh, with this for quite a while. And maybe a last question, because we've heard in many of the previous uh, presentations, you know, notions of uh, sort of concrete fieldwork. Is there any fieldwork in, in your practice or, or research? There used to be, yes. There used to be, but I, not at the moment. No. Can you tell us about these previous fields? Uh, well, yes, as, as I said, as I went to this castle or... Uh, also, I visited fraternities, um, also... When I came in to, came to Brussels eight years, seven years ago, I I like to go to um, the European Parliament and and make films about the green politicians and their their speed networking dinners, which which was a kind of a specific format developed by a German founder of the Green Party. So there was th this link, but then at some point I also enjoyed going without camera. Yes, these are, these, this would be my, my field work, and now it is, it is not so much there. At, yeah. Peter, thank you very, very much. Thanks a lot. So now I think uh, we've got about 15 minutes for more discussions, and also, you know, if there are questions uh, from the floor, we should definitely start to uh, gather them. So uh, please let us know if you have questions. But I wanted to see if there are any reactions from your side to what, if you want to react to each other or... Well, I was just uh, thinking about the relationship between archaeology and violence. We were also thinking about the distance you have with the past. And recently I was uh, talking with a friend who did the research on forensic anthropology and what's the difference between like the fresh remains of the past and the more distant remains and how we, yeah, how we place ourselves with this. made the, the pottery even now they have discovered that women were the painters in the prehistorical caves and that the actual hand that they imprinted on the wall was a woman's hand so <laughs> tell us more about that I have no well I just read an article recently maybe a few months ago about this uh, that uh, they think now that most of the drawings were made by women, which I think is a great discovery. <laughs> I don't know more about it. Uh, yeah. You see, this is... It's interesting how whole fantasies of cultural relations can be built up on the assumption that they're male handprints. From that point on, you get a whole series of constructions. I mean, we can laugh about it now because this is all being overturned as time. But you know, in previous generations, the assumptions were that, you know, these were men's handprints, men were the artists, and 
you know, so forth. Thank you for that. Uh, to, uh, I mean, to relate to my, my Marianne uh, question, uh, I was also thinking it's, it's quite interesting our, also our relation with the past, especially, of course, when it comes to, to human remains and uh, we were speaking about violence and then there is, of course, some, something, some human remains that are very like from ancient past and then something that are more from recent conflicts uh, where uh, maybe politics plays a big role and then also the issue of violence. But uh, I think it's also like, it's always very impressive when you find something that is like a skull and then you start ask, asking questions and then it can be from a recent past or very, very like far away past. But I'm, I think I'm more interested in this sort of projection and uh, this sort of imagination that makes us ask many questions and then scientists and anthropologists uh, and uh, archaeologists answer like even like when we ask uh, what did he eat, uh, wh what was his life, uh, how did he travel and all these questions that now maybe the, the recent, uh, uh, even more the recent uh, like uh, research is answering uh, through all these tests and carbon tests but I, I think my, my main fascination, my main relation was towards this uh, question and then of course it comes politics, it comes uh, forward uh, very often because when we don't know where this skull uh, to who belongs, uh, we always kind of have a, a certain a fear that it belongs to something close to us. And I would like to say one thing that uh, quite a few years ago when President Sadat said all the mummies should be reburied. Because it's, uh, so I was, I was at first shocked, and then I said, of course he's right. This is a violation of tombs, and um, these mummies are alive. As you know, the DNA is still there. So the ancient Egyptians found a way to keep uh, life going. But um, so the, there is a problem in archaeology between... Uh, grave digging, which we wouldn't support doing for a recent person. Uh, and why do we do it for the old people? I mean, ancient ancestors. But without this, we would know nothing about the past. And without the art we found in those pyramids and graves, we would know nothing about the past. So it's a problematic uh, question. Yes. <laughs> but you see what it made me think of this notion that we were talking about the human body as an artifact, the dead body um, one of the things I found out about okay, I'm, also, I'm also interested in museum collections and what they are what they're actually telling us and um, in the United States you know when the Native American people uh, came into conflict with the aggressive appropriation of their lands and so forth. There were many violent events. And in museums in the United States, a number, a majority of artifacts, Native American artifacts, were captured uh, after these kind of battles. And among these artifacts, until very recently, were human parts because the soldiers used to get a bounty if they cut off a finger. And the whole idea of scalping apparently started with the army, not with the Native Americans, and et cetera, et cetera. So these fingers and things, and other things like um, penises, for example, ended up in museums, like in the Museum of the American Indian. Well, as time passed, of course, people were horrified by this. So those objects are gone from the museums. And the blood has been cleaned off the blankets and so forth. Because we don't think of them as good war trophies the way people used to think of them. So our past is always being censored as well. And our view of ourselves and our humanity and who we are in relationship to other humans is always being modified. And these traces of really th of things we find quite horrifying now are gone. Now, I don't know where they've gone to, these artifacts. I know that with the Australian Aboriginal people, they have reclaimed 
their artifacts from Australian museums, and they've attempted to uh, censor or retrieve things from the British Museum, like sacred stones that have maps on them and things like that. It's, it's a very interesting ongoing problem, but at least now it's on a legal level, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I just I just had a thought when you were talking about when, when we started digging up the past, and and it actually wasn't that long ago. I mean, when we started digging it up and putting it into certain frameworks of knowledge, I mean, it's a 19th century activity, and it's related to also theory of origins and a kind of Darwinian uh, discourse that was starting, um, which which is very much kind of the, uh, the epistemology which we're in today. So also, but may, but maybe as artists, maybe. Usually, the approach is to try to to avoid that kind of um, theory of origin approach and maybe look for more um, a more human um, a human truth, if you can say that. Maybe that's the moment uh, to open it up. It's also fascinating because you know we're speaking before about Paolozzi and uh, the uh, that evening in the Cedric Prize lecture about food and time and architecture and archaeology in the Sir John Stone's kitchen ended up over dinner in a huge, huge argument if the Egyptian mummy in the stone's house, you know, should be reburied. So it's kind of connected to that. Do we have questions from the floor, from all of you, for our speakers? Is there a question here, Massimo? Can we have the microphone in the first row, please? It's working? Yes. Uh, I, I learned something today that Archaeology has the same origin etymologically as archive. Archaeology is the science studying the past, and the archive is a place where we preserve the past. This said, uh, I'm not an artist, I'm, I'm a, a gallerist, I'm a dealer. And I was born, as you can see, quite a while ago in a little valley of the Alps, Valca Monica, which is probably the most important place for rock carvings in, in Europe and may, maybe in the world. And they took the risk to become an archaeologist, but I escaped. And finally, I went to the contemporary art instead of studying the past. But since then, I'm always uh, questioning myself what is, the, what is connecting the, such, such a long past with the contemporaneity. And, uh, and if you close your eyes, you can see, I have no slides here, but you can think about Stonehenge or all the circle of stone in, 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 in the world, in Scotland, in, in, in Scandinavia, all over, in Normandy, and uh, a circle of stone of Richard Long. You can see, you can see, see uh, the circle, the, the line in Nazca and the line made in the desert by, uh, with, with the motorbike by Michael Eiser. You can see, you can see a labyrinth and the spiral jetty of, Richard, uh, of Robert Smithson. So there are many, many things who connect the, the, the very, very long past to the contemporaneity, to the art we defend. And when I saw your, your door, uh, the, the, the five or six uh, clay uh, parallel people in, uh, appearing in, in, the, in the slide, I uh, suddenly realized to something like Stonehenge. So uh, I think not, not only the artists, we can talk about the artists as archaeologists, but also the gallerists as archaeologists, or the human being as archaeologists, because we all are connected with, with that f uh, su such a long past, which is permanent in our life of today with, with science, with, uh, with, with drawings. In fact, we say, at the beginning was the, the word, al principio era il verbo. But we can also say at the beginning was the drawing, because I think the, the human being who wanted to communicate each other before inventing the alphabet, before inventing the grammar, before inventing a literature or whatever, they started to communicate with signs, which is very much easier. Uh, I end this communication with, with a little story. I was in Africa recently. I wanted to make a coffee, and the, and the coffee machine didn't, didn't, didn't stay on, on top of the gas fire. So I went to the shop to buy the extension to hold, 
but we couldn't understand each other. So I took a piece of paper, I made a drawing, and they, they gave me what they wanted to have. So at the beginning it was the drawing, not the verb. Thank you, Thank you very much. Does anybody want to answer to that or comment? Just very briefly, I, th I, I, I like that anecdote. I mean, because I think one of my motivations also for looking at archaeology or kind of an ancient archaeology, if it's Paleolithic or Mesopotamian or so on, is it's also looking for something that's uh, kind of before language, actually. It's uh, about a very kind of primordial kind of creation and, and urge. Have other questions or comments? Yeah, we have a question here. Can we have the microphone in the second row, please? Um, hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, really nice to be here. Um, Jamili Hassan is a Lebanese artist living in London, Ontario, and she did this wonderful project where she did a residency at the Eldon House, which is a, I'm going to make this quick, which is a, a historical colonial house. And during her residency, she did a several really interesting interventions, but throughout of it, she found that there was a skull in the house that belonged to a Mexican person that the colonial family had brought into London, Ontario, and was refusing to return. Through her research, she discovered the family, and um, at the end of her residency, she returned the skull to the family to much uh, great appreciation, because they could finally bury the body appropriately. Um, I guess there was a level of irreverence in her approach to archaeology, or history, or um, the uh, archive of that house that necessitated this relationship. And I just wanted, if you guys could maybe elaborate a little bit about your relationship to these disciplines that are highly disciplinary, and if it's your kind of ignorance about it, maybe. I don't, I don't mean that in a rude way, but that kind of skepticism that necessitates this new critical eye. Like, are you always a level of non-believer in these disciplines that, as artists, you enter? And I know uh, you mentioned you're an archaeologist by trade, or by uh, much closer study. Um, thanks. Thank you. Who wants to answer that? Well, I think hmm, from my experience, it's, it, it's not just that the artist arrives to these territories of archaeology with a septic view. It's also the, the whole practice of archaeology has been changing a lot itself. So even the young archaeologists that I know of nowadays, they are very septic about the historical narratives, about how you treat evidence, like the example you were putting of a horizontal archaeological site where you treat the evidence and the interpretation in another level. So it's, uh, I think also the language is changing a lot, not just in relationship with contemporary art, but also in relationship on how, in, in general, we treat material evidence nowadays. I, I think it can also take, a, a, like this archaeological approach, can also take a lot of options away from the possibilities of producing art. And I, I, I don't know, I'm a little bit uh, irritated by, uh, by the social upgrade or so uh, professional to, to, have, to compare yourself to another job because it is not, uh, you're not archaeologist, I'm, I'm definitely not one and uh, this claiming to be, is, is, it has such an academic background and that's where the whole movement, movement comes from. It's, it's kind of getting closer to the, to the academical standards and I don't know if that's really such a uh, good thing and I also don't know if, if there would be any other panel talk, maybe let's, uh, for example, bakers as plumbers or something, you know, you, I would, <laughs> things like this, it doesn't, you cannot really, but then if you say, uh, managers as doctors, that's okay again because it's the same social level, you know, it's a career, but yeah, yeah, you cannot do this with the, with the lower professions in a way, you know, but and then this kind of reasonable, but maybe that's okay. But. That's a good point, but the question is obviously if it's, but Simon, you wanted to say something. I just wanted to say that uh, when we respond to archaeology, of course, there's the narrative, the texts, they are very important and so on. But we also, as artists, I think, can communicate with the artists who produced the piece of art. We have a... a, a yeah, uh, I don't find the word in English now, but 
That's what I want to say. You mean like... Connection or empathy to the... When you contemplate a piece of art, you understand things. You don't have to make it a whole narrative. I don't know. I don't know. Also, I mean, it's, I, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. You could say... Uh, the archaeologist is poet, the artist, I mean, you know, it's a metaphor. I don't think anyone here is claiming professional uh, qualifications, nor do they wish to be academics, or they would be. Um, it's, it's a metaphor, and um, I think it was good that you pointed out that we may be giving or misrepresenting <laughs> our uh, professional expertise, but I don't think we intended that. No. <laughs> but I think that um, that that there's another. I mean, this all gets worse if we put in artifacts artifacts in our shows. You know, this is this is this is not a problem, and it, there are people who do it very well. But uh, what what does it what does it really mean? Like, let the world speak for itself. Let history speak for itself. And, um, let reality read the poems. Or I don't. You know, there's something of kind of this hands-off, hands-free conceptualism that I, I don't, you know, you pass knowledge through. And I, I sometimes miss things that are adding to this knowledge or even uh, neglecting it or even giving it away again or in a different way. It is this kind of, look what I found, this is for you thing. This is sometimes I, li I, I find irritating through artifacts. No, oh, yeah, not you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can take one or two last questions. There was a question here in the second row. I can't see behind because it's... So if there are questions behind, maybe someone else can point the microphone. I saw there is a, a question here in the second row. Just a quick question for Mariana. You said that in the past they tended to make three-dimensional copies, but today they only take a two-dimensional and digital photograph. How will that affect the understanding of the past, this, in my view, simplification. Yeah, we were also discussing that a lot, like how the relationship with archaeology is going to change through the digital world, and how, I mean, also digital data is going to disappear very soon, and maybe faster than all the ruins and the monuments. So we are relying, actually, on something that is even more fragile and and ephemeral as what we think. But it's much quicker and it's much more efficient. But it has a different, I think uh, from what you were saying that there are different kinds of time, I think we are arriving to a new kind of time that it's much more horizontal, where this notion of layering is not, is not present anymore. So this digital evidence, which is two-dimensional, is like a very big surface, like a sort of rhizome. So everything is connected, but it's not layered. And I think that it's a different way of thinking as well, somehow. Uh, I would like to add something in relation to this technology that maybe brings back to the idea on buried back that uh, uh, with, uh, I mean, there is a possibility of scanning. What they are doing is they scan the land, the site to see what is there. And it's, I find this uh, incredible because basically then you can decide to excavate or not, or to leave it there. And then, of course, maybe I have a little bit of, uh, I'm a little bit skeptical, but I also really like the idea of imagine what is under the ground. So. Uh, with the scientific research, they can see, but actually that's also a, a, a new imagination without digging. And then leave it for a, a future people to find something else, so like to find new technology to see and have again seeing maybe three-dimensional without even see the object. So that's uh, maybe a, a different way of layering even in the digital. There, were, there was also this discussion of how to bury nuclear remains, yes. uh, so yes. nuclear waste, and who's going to excavate this nuclear waste, or how do you hide it, or how do you make people understand that they shouldn't excavate it? <laughs> Maybe one last question. There's one here. Yeah, is it on the left here on the second row? Hi. Um, thanks for your talk. I 
I, it's fascinating and I empathize a lot with the discussion of looking into the past and creative new, creating new documents in a sense as an artist. But there's one thing I wanted to throw in which is passion and jealousy. Because I think as an artist, I'm very jealous at archaeology. I mean, it survived. And I'm not sure I'm going to survive. And there's a kind of a basic, I mean, it's the other side of passion, which we all share, this kind of love. So I keep wondering, why am I so fascinated? It's not nostalgia. And it's kind of, there are these, I mean, looking at the panel with all these women here, of course, and there are this kind of like je basic jealousy of these erected things that survived the war of life and survived the war of art. And this, this kind of, um, you know, wanting to be one of them. So it's, it's another motivation, except for this intellectual digging into this kind of critical position of how we occupy spaces by something that existed and how we erase the present by the past. It's, it's something very, very primal. It's kind of like, and I'm just realizing it myself l listening to you. So, yeah, wonder if you empathize somehow with this kind of visceral feeling. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I knew you would. <laughs> I'm, I'm not so jealous, I must say. Uh, well, you're, you know, you're the erected one, so... I'm not the erected <laughs> one. I'm, I'm, I just think that it is... Uh, that it's just a very thankful thing in, in, in contemporary presentation forms that it just looks very good. And you can make shows with it. That's, uh, I think that's also part of big part of the attraction, and as I said, that it feels like you're actually doing something. Mm -hmm. I'm not cynical about it, or it's yeah. just that it's generating, it's also generating a lot of jobs. It's not even mimicking, not only mimicking labor, it's also producing a lot of jobs because people have to sit in the juries and, and judge these things, and um, production is always outsourced in a way. Because it's either you did something, or you have well, you know. That I I think it's very complex, and it's not that that it's just being jealous about uh, uh, about being dead or about the past. No, I'm jealous about the life that they yes, have, the not life. about yes. the fact that they're yes. dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> Alright, this is a great way to end. Maybe we can all, in terms of jealousy, reread Alain Rob Grier. I just wanted to say one thing related to what Peter said. I think, you know, uh, no one obviously would claim here to be an academic uh, archaeologist, but I think one of the things which is uh, very interesting, Etel Nan uh, once, you know, talked about this idea that we can have many parallel realities, you know. She's a um, uh, political activist and journalist, she's a poet, has made a huge contribution to poetry, is at the same time a visual artist, so it is possible to have these parallel realities, I mean, in Dada that existed and so on. So, uh, and maybe another thing I wanted to say in relation to that, because it is very much at the core of these panels, you know, the artist as a poet, the artist as an architect, the artist as a... Uh, archaeologist is very often, you know, somebody who isn't at all from that field. I mean, Dan Graham would never claim to be an architect. He says, architecture is my hobby. Yet all my architecture friends say he knows more about architecture than them. You know, the other day I sat next to a fly fishing expert on the plane who kept quoting, you know, the great Joseph Grigley. Now, Joseph Grigley is a great visual artist. He isn't a fly fisher, but as a visual artist, he changed the course of fly fishing. So thank you all very much for being here. Thanks, Rosella, Mariana, Simone, Susan, Jumana. Peter, thank you.